toy lines must end. What the heck was that all about? We were so bold that we were splashing out this giant poster with original art telling everyone that Masters of the Universe Classics was coming to an end, and then it didn't, and this entire ad campaign got completely lost in the shuffle when I left Mattel. I'm Scott Toy Guru Knight, like I was the brand manager of Masters of the Universe Classics, and I was behind what was going to be this brand transition. That never happened. So what was All Toy Lines Must End? Well, it was the start of a marketing campaign to push what we were calling the final year of Masters of the Universe Classics. But this was not going to be the end of 6-inch He-Man toys. Not by a long shot. This was a marketing campaign. A marketing campaign that was dropped by my, uh, uh, well, I guess the, the, the people who took over the brand after I left Mattel, uh, who basically decided to go in a different direction. And that's fine. But we did have this beautiful art, this beautiful art that, for those of you who may not recognize, was a homage or a ripoff or a satire parody of the Game of Thrones art from, was it season four of Game of Thrones, I want to say? But this was like everywhere, especially in Los Angeles where I was living. It's like every billboard was this darn raven dropping these swords. So it was very, it was very much in sort of pop culture at the time which was kind of why we did the, the spoof ad with Zor instead of the Three-Eyed Crow. But, you know, now in hindsight, looking back a few years, it's like, wow, we did this whole ad campaign based on this parody of an ad, and that season's like a long over. All right, so besides the origin of why we did that art, Masters of the Universe Classics at this time in 2015 had gotten pretty big. I mean, we had done uh, close to 200 figures and we were really thinking, you know, we got the, the biggest minds, the best minds in the brand around, and we sat around, and we, we talked at our, you know, our conference table, and, I mean, it wasn't quite like this. We didn't exactly all lay our magic rods down, but we were really looking at the brand and saying, where can we go from here? You know, the brand was now over, you know, five, six, seven years old, but more importantly, from a financial standpoint, it was costing more and more to make these figures, and we knew that... As we got to more obscure characters, we were going to kind of lose a bit of the fan base, especially as the cost to make the figures continued to go up. I actually put together a chart for uh, management showing the, the cost of the figures versus the uh, how many figures we had left to make and kind of where that, that crossing point was, was happening, that we were essentially outpacing ourselves. And... We knew it was time to kind of start looking a little deeper into the Motu world and kind of embrace, you know, some new versions of main characters and really see where we could take the brand from here. What kind of new directions, new art styles, you know, maybe looking back at 2000X, looking forward at Filmation or looking backwards at Filmation, but that meaning that would be the future. I don't even know where. Time travel gives me headaches. The point being is when we were planning out the 2015-2016 line, one of the big things was we knew it was time to do something new. And a big part of that was the main characters. The main characters had all been done, and we were now down to, like, third-tier characters. The main ones always sold better, like, way better than, you know, the third-tier characters, even, you know, New Adventures or, you know, the 30th Anniversary figures. The number one sellers were always the main ones and the figures that had been in the vintage line. Now, looking at other lines, like Marvel Legends, which was a, a sort of contemporary of Motu Classics, at, which had be, you know, was putting out sort of the definitive version of Marvel characters, highly articulated. This was supposed to be kind of like the, the end stop for Marvel characters. You know, once they got into Marvel Legends, this was like the last figure you were ever going to need of a character because it was now done and you know, could never be done any better until it was done better. So I use this example of uh, Captain Marvel, or Marvel, or whatever, however you want to call him. Uh, I'm not even going to try to call him Shazam. That would just be crazy. The idea that you could revisit a character years later, you know, I think is something being proven by Marvel Legends right now, and you can actually make major improvements. I mean, look at these two Captain Marvel figures side by side, and they almost look like they're not even part of the same line. The original one on the right 
is almost like an inch shorter and way scrawnier. And it's almost like the Hasbro Marvel Legends and the Toy Biz Marvel Legends are kind of almost two completely separate toy lines if you really look at them side by side. So the idea of revisiting a character and doing it again was something we were really, you know, we were struggling with it, but we wanted to do it because we knew that the original He-Man, you know, who kicked off the line, King Grayskull kicked off the line, but, you know, he was a, you know, an early figure, the second figure, he was getting a little long in the tooth. You know, we had, we'd introduced new levels of articulation at this point, you know, wrist articulation, and there was a lot of improvements that could be done. But how were fans going to react if we did a brand new He-Man, a character they already had? Was it going to be seen as a waste of a slot? Was it going to be seen as, hey, we already you know, shelled out money for this. Why aren't you doing someone else with that slot? So kind of one of the test figures was Tila. We knew, again, she was a little long in the tooth in the sense that, you know, I mean, her original articulation didn't work right. She was an early figure, a figure a lot of fans weren't able to get because she never had a second run, if you will. So very deliberately, she was scheduled as kind of a test of this concept by doing a new version of her that wound up coming with the Talon Fighter. This wasn't a filmation version, but it was kind of a filmation version as seen through the lens of classics, if you will. Um, you know, I mean, simplified outfit, outfit more inspired by what she wore in the animation, but it wasn't meant to be a direct animated version of Tila. That was going to come later with the, uh, I guess, the, what they called the Club Grayskull line, where it was a direct animated version of Tila. So doing this new version was kind of sort of just, you know, I guess a trial balloon to see what fans were going to think of the idea of revisiting the main characters while we still had our eye on all of the obscure kind of third and fourth tier characters that we knew fans were going to really want. Uh, you know, it had been quote unquote fan demanded for many years. So this was basically the toss up. This is where we were basically having internal debates was how do we find a way to do this? And that's where the whole marketing campaign came from. So it was really the idea of we wanted to give fans a get-out-of-jail-free card. Basically, if they didn't want to rebuy He-Man and Tila and Man-at-Arms and Skeletor in their classic outfits again, then we weren't going to, you know, if you will, hold a gun to their head and make them buy it, um, you know, as part of classics. So the idea was by ending, quote-unquote, classics, the toy line called Masters of the Universe Classics, it was going to allow fans who did want to get off the train an opportunity to do that and say, I have the complete collection. I have every Masters of the Universe Classics figure. While at the same time, we were then going to be able to introduce new lines like the Filmation series, which I heavily worked on before it got passed off to Super 7, as new ways of getting the main characters out there. So this was kind of the low-hanging fruit, was doing the filmation look for all the characters, because we could do all of the main characters over again. And that was always part of the plan. That's why, like, the San Diego Comic-Con Horde Act did not come with an animated style head, because we knew that we were working on a filmation series, and we would be releasing that version of Horde Act as part of the animation you know, the, what became Club Grayskull, I guess, if you will, or you know, I always just thought of as, as Motu animated. But, uh, you know, and here he is. Like, this is what uh, he looked like, and this is exactly why we didn't include this head with the previous release. Although he did get, oddly, accessories from classics, but that's a whole other story. I mean, Super 7, I think, put this one together. But you can see this was deliberate with the idea to get someone to buy another version of the main character. So as far as branding, and yes, I know there is a podcast that is now called this, but I think before the podcast came along, the name that we were going to rebrand the line was going to be Masters of the Universe Chronicles. It was actually going to be Motu Chronicles. So it was going to say M-O-T-U Chronicles to sort of play up because Motu had never actually been on packaging. It always said Masters of the Universe. So we, that way it would have kept the same initials, M-O-T-U-C, but been a little bit different. And we were also going to repackage the figures under the Chronicles line. So it wasn't going to be with the red brick. This was being saved for a retail release in a movie year, thinking that we could flank, you know, five or six feet of movie product with one foot of classics product. And that's what we were saving deliberately the red brick packaging for, was that hopeful 
release at retail. The Motu Chronicles line was going to be boxed, so we were basically looking at what was happening with current trends in action figures and seeing that a lot of them were moving towards this boxed package execution, which was also great because it allowed the benefit of taking the figures in and out of package without destroying the package, and really liked that. And we've seen this, you know, this has kind of been adopted, well, Hasbro does this for like all of their lines. And all their lines now have like a name, you know, it's like the Plasma Series and the Black Series, and you know, Mattel calls their Jurassic Park ones the, the what, the um, Amber Collection. So it was kind of like that, um, the idea of boxing it. And what's, what was funny is when I saw the um, DC Multiverse line, I hate to tell this was it, this was the package. I was like, hey, wait a minute, that was the Masters of the Universe Chronicles, or the Motu Chronicles package. They just basically took the work we did for that, and they gave it to the DC line. So it just kind of made me chuckle, think, at least seeing that, like, you know, it didn't go to waste. At least it got used. But, uh, you know, that was basically what the Motu Chronicles packaging was going to look like. And so really, while we were going to end the classics, it, you know, it was being done, as I said, to give Fans like get out of jail free cards. If they didn't want to rebuy the main characters again, they could do so and still feel like they got rewarded with a full collection. But if they wanted to keep going, they could just switch over to Motu Chronicles and we would keep making figures. It, it was much more of a breath of fresh air and a way to do a new beginning than really end everything. But we started with that very dramatic, all toy lines must end purely because of PR. It was a way to get everyone's attention, and kind of a shock value. But ideally, this would have transitioned into Motu Chronicles, which we would have announced at Comic-Con. But as I said, the new team went in a different direction. And if you like directions, and if you like videos, subscribe. Let me know what you think. Did I miss anything? Anything else want me to cover about this subject? Leave it in the comments below. Give me a thumbs up and a subscription and bell ring and all the things YouTube asks me to tell people. And I'll see you guys around the internet.